Good morning. Welcome. I welcome you to this online service of worship from wherever you are, in your homes, on the road, nearby or far away. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. If you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you're able to chat with us and we enjoy being able to connect with one another, welcome one another, uh, share our gratitude, share our prayer concerns, and just be in connection with one another as we worship this morning. Today we're going to look at the parable of the fig tree that wasn't bearing fruit. And we're going to look at how God is our compassionate gardener that uses the soil and the manure of our lives to strengthen us and to help us bear good fruit. Warren Buffett's son said that we are all born into someone else's story, meaning we have a family soil and a family manure. We have generational soil and generational manure. We have the soil and the manure of our own choices and our own experiences. And we have the soil and the suffering of our faith bearing the resurrected and the transformed life. So join us today as we look at this parable and we see Jesus reference the gardener who cares compassionately with hope, belief, confidence, and faith, and even using the manure to help urge the tree to be all that it's meant to be. We always begin with words of gratitude. We like to prime ourselves with thankfulness as we worship. And I would love to know what you're grateful for this morning or what you're thankful for. And it could be the smallest of things. It could be some deep, profound, and very large things. I'll begin and I'll invite you to share in, your ch in our chat area anything that you might be grateful for. But this week, I'm very grateful for the gifts of our families and our friends, for those people who are a part of our inner circles who love us and care for us and see the potential in us. And I love the sounds of cranes. The cranes have come back to my neighborhood and I just love hearing them as they migrate farther north. And I love the warmer days that we have been having a little bit of hints of as we're able to be in some of the places maybe in our homes that don't have heat or out on the trails that had been snow covered up until just recently. So grateful for the warmer days. What are you grateful for this morning? I'd love to know what you're grateful for. And if you'd share it in the chat area, that would be great. Or just hold it as we share in this affirmation of gratitude that we share together every Sunday. Lord, you are an abundant giver. There is nothing that I have that you have not given me. The way of your kingdom is the way of generosity. Help us to honor you with our resources. Free us from the deceit of riches. Lead us on the path of generosity. For your glory, Lord, for the abundance of our own lives and for the sake of others. Amen. This morning, as we come together and share in the very important work of praying together, as we focus our minds collectively on some of these prayer requests that I will share, and as we also focus our hearts and minds on those that might be shared in our chat area. I'd like to offer these prayer requests this week. We'd like to pray for Celeste, who continues to be hospitalized and who continues to recover. And we pray for her recovery and we pray that she would know strength and patience as she recovers. We pray for Karen, who is Jerry's sister, who had a heart attack recently and who needed a surgical procedure. And so we pray for her and her recovery. We want to pray for all of our college students and others who have been on spring break or who are going on spring break for their safety and their travels. 
We want to pray for anyone who is dealing with any anxiety or any other kind of mental health concern. We want to pray for Gail, who is on hospice care, and to remember the, uh, with the family of Cynthia Galster, who died this past week. Cynthia's service will be on April 9th at 11 at the church, if you are interested in that information. We also want to keep in our prayers the family of Randy Beecher, who is cousin to Kelly, who died from COVID this past week. And also keep in prayer all those who have recently lost a loved one or for whom this time is the anniversary of a loss of a loved one or anyone just grieving the loss of someone they love. And today again, we, pe we keep in our prayers the people of Ukraine and uh, their situation of war declared upon them, their displacement uh, for all who have died. And we ask that God would help us through the power of prayer to be instrumental in being people of peace. What prayer requests do you bring this morning as we pray together? If you list those in the chat area, we'll be able to include those. And would you join with me in a moment of prayer as we share together and then conclude with our Lord's Prayer? So let us pray together. Lord, we gather together this morning from our various places and times but we open up the door to your sacred presence as it sheds its light upon these prayers that we share today, the prayers that we have on our own hearts, the prayers that are in our chat area. Lord, these are prayers for individuals. These are prayers for countries. These are prayers for people who are grieving the loss of a loved one. These are prayers of safety and protection. These are prayers for understanding and for wisdom. And these prayers, Lord, are prayers that we might take seriously and be completely focused on who you are as you would work through us. Lord, we remember those near and dear to us. We remember those we don't know, but for whom we have prayer requests this morning. And we remember our world. And we would ask that what is true would be that which wins and has the victory. And that compassion would be seen in all of your creation. Open the eyes of those who have made people disposable. Open the eyes of those who have declared war. Open the minds and the hearts and the eyes of those who are making choices that are taking lives. May the truth be known. May the truth prevail. Lord, we pause in a moment of quietness as we share personal prayer requests with you and as we seek the presence of your Holy Spirit. Now, O oh Lord, we gather as your people sharing in the English language a prayer that is shared all over the world in the multitude of languages and places. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning's scripture reading comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. And as I'll say at the beginning of my sermon, there are three contexts that are referenced here. And as you listen, see if you find these three contexts that are shared. At that very time, there were some present who told him, Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. May God bless these words to our hearts and to our minds and to our understanding.
tragedy presented in our scriptures this morning. Did you catch them? The first is the context of death, where the Galileans were killed during worship by the hand of Pilate, and their blood intermingled with sacrifices. And then by death in the random tragedy where the Tower of Siloam fell and killed 18 people, and finally, the third context, this seeming worthless, fruitless fig tree, taking up soil, but not producing any fruit. As Jesus is talking with the people, he is sensing judgmental and faulty reasoning that the people were using to try and make sense of these horrific deaths and he responds with this parable. As human beings, we are prone to fear and magical thinking, which tries to say to us that there must have been something that those Galileans or those Jeru Jerusalem people did wrong, and therefore they were less worthy, and this is why they died. This is why what happened to them happened. And then we say things like, there but for the grace of God, as if God deems some more worthy of grace and we're among them, but others not as worthy. Or maybe we have wondered ourselves in the depth of our souls if we are less worthy and that's why we couldn't bear children or that's why something bad happened to our child or to our children. Or that's why God allowed something to happen to us. Or that's why. And we identify with the less worthy fig tree that's unable to produce the fruit a normal fig tree should produce. We judge ourselves less. We judge ourselves flawed. Irreparably sinners. Unforgivable. It is this condemning of others or of ourselves that Jesus is confronting with his words, repent or you will perish. When Jesus tells the people they need to repent or they will perish, he's talking about them changing their minds from judging and justifying and assigning, assigning blame and to see with the gardener's perspective. As we look at those disasters, those tragedies, those injustices, those random deaths, Jesus asks us not to figure out who is more blessed or more worthy because that's a false metric in the kingdom of God. Jesus asks us not to think that God is in those deaths, causing those disasters, turning blind eyes to injustices, and allowing tragedies to happen for some reason so that we can learn a lesson or whatever rationalization we might conjure in our thinking. Jesus is confronting some deep-seated prejudices and attitudes and fears and asked the people to repent of these, he asked the people to change their thinking. Metanoia, which is the Greek word for repent, means to change one's mind or to turn our thinking in a different direction, to think differently. It means to let go of tightly held and settled upon understandings that are shaped and molded not by Christ, but by cultural judgment and fear. 
the gardener confronts the attitude that the tree is disposable or unworthy of continued life. And instead of taking an ax to the tree, the gardener argues for taking nurturing time, caring compassion, even manure worked into the soil to bring the possibilities of fruit from the tree. Jesus, through the gardener, was asking people to see from his point of view and from the truth that God so loved the world that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life and that God did not come to condemn the world but that the world would be saved. The tree was worthy. The Galileans were worthy and loved. The people who died when the tower fell were worthy and loved. We are worthy and loved. All who perish in tragedy are worthy and loved. In these scriptures, Jesus entered into the social, the economic, and the political culture of the day. He didn't sidestep or spiritualize this. Rather, he met them with an incarnate love and the presence of God. That has always been his mission. That continues to be his mission as Jesus brings the kingdom of God to earth. That God's kingdom would come to earth as it is in heaven. Lent invites serious attention to our relationship with God, knowing that we are completely worthy to God. I found a quote that I deeply respect, and I suspect that it might have come from my work in the Transforming Center, because at the end of the quote, it includes words from Robert Mulholland, but I'd like to share it with you on the screen here. It says, a vital Christian spirituality with a growing relationship with God at the heart of one's being is going to be incarnated in the reality of the social, the economic, and political context in which we live. That kind of spirituality is going to be relevant, revolutionary, and transforming. But it means we are going to live in creative tension always. The journey of faith, the path to spiritual wholeness, lies in our increasingly faithful response to the one whose purpose shapes our path, whose grace redeems our detours, whose power liberated us from the crippling bondages of our previous journey, and whose transforming presence meets us at each turn in our road. With one mindset, we are tempted to read our parable as a warning that we better get busy at producing fruit. We're just given one more chance that God is the tree owner and we are the tree. But in our parable, What if the social, the economical, the political context is not that God is the tree owner, but God is the gardener? How would Jesus be working in transformative ways in our minds towards metanoia, towards repenting? How would God be working with us in our contexts? Maybe it would be to confront our attitudes of pride and self-righteousness. I know that's one of my contexts. Let me explain and give an example. We know that hard work is a hallmark of proud Midwestern people. And growing up as the granddaughter and the daughter of farmers, I was imprinted with the pride of working hard, long hours. That was the soil that I was born into. And I was also imprinted with the faith interpretation that somehow hard work would equal blessings. If I just worked hard enough, God would bless me. 
maybe that was part of your upbringing. Another piece of it was if I suffered, there must be something I did wrong or not enough of. And it also meant that if other people were suffering, then they must have done something wrong or they were lazy. That was part of the soil, and then I went to live in Mexico, and I didn't realize until I lived in Mexico for three and a half years and became part of the culture there, learned the language there, loved a family of people there. I didn't realize that I had lived among some of the hardest working people I had ever met, equal to the work that any farmer did or more and who were by, by all standards quite poor. For all of their hard work, they were still poor. They didn't have running water in their homes is one example. My landlord never had the opportunity to go to school beyond grade three. I had lived there and experienced deep love and valuing of these people who did become my Mexican family. But when I came home and I tried to share how important they were to me, I was met with something I recognized, with a deep-seated, unconfessed attitude of judgment that went back generations. It's how racism continues to be passed on through generations too. And I remember hearing one of my extended family members speak about Mexicans as being lazy. And that wasn't true, but that was, was what had been passed down. That was some of the manure, I think, that had been passed down. When I was in Mexico, Jesus had been a gardener to my soul and helped truly transform my inherited attitudes, my dullness, of imagination because sometimes all we have to do is challenge ourselves to imagine people different from us as being humans just like us. <coughs> Jesus transformed my predisposition of judgment and my pride. The waste of wrong thinking, the manure of my fears. Jesus helped me to become more compassionate towards others who suffered, who were in poverty, who spoke a different language than my own. And I was able to expand my ability to love and to be compassionate. The gardener loves the tree. The gardener knows the potential of the tree. The gardener knows the vulnerability of the tree in the face of tree owner's judgments. The gardener doesn't see the tree as something unreal, inanimate, or utilitarian. You know, the tree was in the middle of a vineyard, so all this time, who, what was getting the attention? Was it the vineyard that was getting the attention and the tree that wasn't? But now the gardener doesn't see the tree as the other or the outsider, but as a part of the vineyard as a part of his life, as a thou. Martin Buber, the great theologian, wrote so eloquently about how we needed to see every living thing as a thou, bearing the image of God. And he talks about the relationship between the I and the thou versus the I and an it. And here are a couple quotes uh, from Martin Buber. He said, the world is not comprehensible, but it is embraceable through the embracing of one of its beings. And he wrote, we cannot avoid using power, cannot escape the compulsion to afflict the world, so let us, cautious in diction, and mighty in contradiction, love powerfully. And when he's speaking of diction, he's speaking of speaking, he's speaking of words. Let us be caution, cautious in what we say. Let us be mighty in seeking the truth. 
Let us love powerfully. The gardener loves the tree. The gardener has compassion on the tree. It is the gardener that represents the incarnation of God through Jesus. And isn't it interesting that in just a few weeks, we will see Jesus showing up as a gardener by the tomb. Finally, I think there might also be another beautiful analogy about what the gardener does. The scriptures are specific in saying that it is the manure that will be used to fertilize the tree. And the fertilizer will prompt the figs. And we all know what manure is. The less polished word, beginning with C, has become a response of ours to tragedies or to things going wrong, for pain and for suffering in the world. We speak manure when something bad happens. This parable helps us realize it's not that God wants to cause any manure in our lives, but God can and will take the manure of our lives and work in transformative ways to help produce the fruit and the outcome. We're getting closer and closer to those days when the poop trucks and the manure spreaders will start running again. And we'll hold our breaths as we pass by them or they pass by us. But they will continue to their fields where they will take the accumulated manure and waste to be spread to prompt the growth of the fields, transforming them into food for our bodies. When this happens, we can remember Jesus as the gardener of our lives, having compassion and hope and faith in us, working with the manure of our lives in life-producing and transformative ways. We can reflect upon what doesn't smell so good in us and who we might be judging as less worthy. We can remember that whenever we are prompted to cut another down in any way, that Jesus would ask us to put down our axes and take up our shovels. Jesus would ask that we invest ourselves in the outcome of God's love incarnate in the world. As those trucks pass us by, let us pray, Jesus, be the gardener in the soil of our souls. Amen.
As we end our service this morning, I have these announcements that I would like to share with you. We have a new book study, and we're studying the Gospel of Luke. We're going through it a little bit quickly, but if you've never studied an entire Gospel, it's been just wonderful conversations and wonderful learning. So if you're interested at all, please let me know. Also want to share with you that um, our Saturday school has begun and we will be meeting this coming Saturday to look at some of the stories of Holy Week. And this is for infants through grade five. And um, we love to have you join us at 930 on Saturday morning. These are the ways that you can financially support our church, and we are so grateful for everyone who financially supports our church. Um, sending a check to the church, having your bank send a check, using electronic funds transfer, that is something you can set up on a recurring basis, or using PayPal, and you can go to the Give tab and then to Online Giving. And this is, again, the month of our collecting the one great hour of sharing offering. That offering is for disaster relief and much of the collections that are taking place right now are being earmarked for Ukraine. And if you would like your giving to go specifically to Ukraine, please just uh, put on your check one great hour of sharing Ukraine or, or note that in the PayPal um, mission giving section. 100% of One Great Hour of Sharing offerings go to help the people of Ukraine and the countries around them with all the refugees from Ukraine. And I'd also like to again play this video clip of uh, the other ways that the One Great Hour of Sharing offering has been used. It's always an offering used for disaster relief of basic life resources. <music> Why is love the greatest? Because love is action. Love is resilient. Love is compassionate. Love digs deeper, goes further, reaches higher. Love gives and then gives some more. Love is big and love is small. One Great Hour of Sharing has been putting our love in action all around the world and right here at home for over 70 years. By responding to disasters, feeding the hungry, digging wells for those who lack water, building for those who need shelter, caring for the sick, empowering the marginalized, and equipping those who are ready to change their world in the name of love, God's love. Because when all is said and done, it's love that remains. Put love into action. Give to one great hour of sharing. And again, you can give to that offering by sending checks to the church or by using the mission part of our PayPal on our website. Thank you so much for being with us today. And here are words of benediction that I hope bless us as we go into this week, as we share the incarnate love of the gardener, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Go now from this service of worship to the service of God's people near and far. Refreshed by the living water that Jesus offers to you, listen for the parched voices of the least of these. Search out the dry places and the arid souls and become for them a spring of living water. And as you go, may the blessings of the God of life, the Christ of love, and the Spirit of grace be upon you this day and forevermore. Amen.